<laughs> All right. Um, so this is about how to use the curry Howard correspondence for practical work. And um, I will first uh, ask you how many how many of you know uh, what that is, the curry Howard correspondence? And uh, yeah, that's not everybody actually. Uh, all right, so I will, um, nevertheless, well, I, I have a short talk, so um, the Curry Howard correspondence is uh, some piece of uh, computer science theory, but um, people have figured out that you can actually use it for practical work by, uh, uh, by generating code automatically from type signatures. So I will show you um, some ways of, how this is done, but let's first uh, think about how we can do it by hand. Uh, so usually people say we, we can write code sometimes guided by the types. So you, let's imagine you have a function like this. This is an F map for the reader monad, uh, which I expect you to be familiar with. Um, now, if I wanted to implement this, then I would just look at the code and I would say, well, I've got to return a function from E to B. So, okay, let me take an E, how do I get a B? Well, I can get a B if I had an A, but how can I get an A? Well, I would have get a, gotten an A if I got an E, but I have an E. So now I, I can kind of see that I could combine these things together and apply one thing to the other and get what I want. So this is what people usually mean by type-directed coding so that uh, you, you kind of look at the type and you try to get what you want and you substitute one thing into the other until it works. Now, actually, this is an example of a type signature that you cannot implement uh, um, as, a, as a generic function. Um, this is another example that you can implement. This is the um, uh, functor instance for a specific uh, type constructor. Um, but here, for example, uh, you can implement things in different ways. So for instance, I can take an E and I can just return nothing here in all cases, ignoring all of this. So I can just ignore these arguments and return nothing. Um, would that be useful? No, it wouldn't be useful, but it will be the right type. So uh, a more useful one would not always return nothing. It will take uh, these things and use them in the right way, which you can figure out pretty easily. Um, so in this case, you see there are several implementations of this type, but some of them may be not, use, not useful. Um, and actually, uh, we know that this is supposed to satisfy laws for, for the functor. And the, the one that always returns nothing will not satisfy those laws. Um, however, the type is, is correct. So if you just say I'm guided by the types, then you can pretend that you have done what you, what you wanted. Um, another example would be this uh, distributive law, which is written in types like this. And uh, this is just an algebraic uh, distributive identity, um, which uh, you can see it's similar to this if you replace plus by disjunction by the either and uh, the, the multiplication by the uh, tuple or, or product type. So then I say, well, can I have a function that takes this tuple and returns this type or, or, or the other way around? And again, you can reason, but this is a little bit more difficult now to figure out if this is true. And here's another example where this is probably hard to figure out if this is even possible to implement such a type. Um, the, the interesting thing is that uh, the problem of finding whether you can implement a type can be solved uh, by an algorithm. And so there's an automatic way of taking a type expression such as this one, uh, applying some procedures to it, and figuring out if there is code that implements this type or not. If you uh, um, give it this expression, it will tell you that there is no implementation. If you, if, if you give it this expression, it will generate, it will give you that there is uh, the code that implements it. 
So there are projects uh, that are called GIN, uh, GHC. Uh, GIN is an older project uh, that did this, that implemented this algorithm. Um, so basically, I just want to say that this algorithm makes, it, makes this consideration formal. It defines precisely what it means to be guided by the types. So it tells you how you're supposed to be guided by the types. What do you do to decide, uh, for example, whether this type could be implemented? Um, so GenGHC uh, is an older uh, library. There is a newer project I just uh, recently found out about, which is to say it doesn't really work. Um, well, it does work, I'm sure, for the author. But uh, if, you look at, if you look at this, then you need uh, GHC 8.5, uh, which I couldn't install. Um, <laughs> you need the absolutely latest nightly GHC, maybe, or something. I don't know. I, I'm not a... I'm not uh, um, sufficiently familiar with this to know how even to install such a thing. But I'm sure that the author has. And so, uh, so this would give you a type class that uh, implements the type. So you write the type and you, you do this, and that's it. So you just magically get the code by uh, writing the type expression. So that's one thing. Um, and the other one is called Curry Howard. It's a Scala library that does much similar thing. So I'm the author of the Curry Howard library in Scala. And these, these people have done it before in Haskell. Uh, now, you need some tooling to actually use it. So this tooling, there's a tutorial uh, somewhere here about how to use this um, in Emacs with some plugins. Is there anything documenting the algorithm for how to translate? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, if I have time, I will explain all that. But, um, or we can, we can talk after my presentation if um, you're interested. Of course, yes. So uh, I'm, I'm presenting this because I'm, uh, uh, well, I, I'm the author of this. So I know exactly what it, what it does and why it, it may not be working. Or, um, yeah, so, but uh, I did it in Scala, and the Haskell one, uh, it's hard for me to understand. And uh, the code is very terse. But I, I know what it's supposed to do. So it's the um, same thing. So as I said, uh, there are often more than one representation, more than one implementation of, of the type. So you need to choose in some way. And both of these libraries, the Jin and uh, Perry Howard, attempt to make a good implementation, to, to choose a good one. So for example, they would re reject here the implementation that always returns nothing. Um, this is a heuristic, of course, but nevertheless a very useful one. Uh, I will show you now some, some demonstrations. So here is a, the, the GIN tool. Um, GIN is a, actually an executable. Uh, it, it is available as a separate executable where you can play with this. And I'll, I'll just show it now. So it, it supports Haskell syntax for types. It supports uh, constant types. So this is an example of what you can do. Uh, let me just copy this, and I'll go into the shell right here. Um, so Jin can define things. So these are the things it already knows. Uh, a bunch of data types it knows about bool, maybe either unit type, it knows the monad type class, and it knows eek type class. So if I did this, then uh, this is the example I was showing you. Um, it tells you this is the code. So it, it generates the Haskell code. Um, now, I want to give you another example, which I like, uh, which is this one. And see, uh, it's correct in terms of type, but it's not what you would think it should do, right? It shouldn't, it shouldn't permute these things. And actually, if you, if you think this is a, you know, a good uh, 
implementation of the unit method for some monad, you're mistaken. You're not supposed to do this. Uh, you know, you, you're not supposed to change the order of things in the tuple. Because if you do that, you're very likely to violate algebraic laws down the road. Um, but you don't see that by looking at the type here. So this library, so yeah, so here's a, um, another thing it can do. So let me define a type. You can define your own types. For example, type um, tree A. Let's say it's a type which is, um, no, let's say it's um, um, A going to unit going to A. Fine. Um, this is a type constructor. Now I can say, does this have a monad instance? Uh, and yes, it does. Well, it thinks it does. We don't really know because we, we have just instantiated the types. Uh, the types can be implemented, but do they actually satisfy the laws of the monad? This we do not know yet. All right. So, uh, so this is what you can do. Um, you can write has some Haskell types. You can define your own types. Uh, for example, type int. And then you could use int in what I just did. Int would have been just an opaque type. Um, we don't know what it is. And so <coughs> any, see, this is a different code because now here it knows it's a unit, so you know what to do with it. But here, int is considered to be a completely opaque type. And so the int value things are opaque. You don't know what to do with them, so you have to keep them. So that's kind of better, maybe. Um, the code is certainly looks more plausible. Well, it's not to say that the code is readable, and that you know what it's doing, and that, that it's doing the right thing. So that's, uh, that's kind of what it can do. So let me just very quickly show you the Scala equivalent. It's very, very similar. The Scala syntax is more verbose, and it has very similar features. Um, I added some more features, which might be interesting for people if, you're, if you only want to work on a Haskell thing, um, to check laws. I have features that check laws. Let me, let me try to do that. Um, Mm. Uh, uh, let me see. I want to do IO. Yeah. So this is this is my Scala REPL. Let me see if it, oh, yeah, it works. Okay. So I want to say uh, I want to do the same things. I want to define this function. So from triple of AAA into a maybe. So maybe in Scala is called. Uh, option, so, but it's the same thing. So it's diff. let me say some function, and the type is a a a going to option a a a, and that's uh, equals implement. Ah, right. So. It actually fails to do that. It tells me that I have six inequivalent ways of implementing this thing. <clears throat> and it doesn't know how to choose between them. And so it fails at compile time. But I know why, how to plug with it. I, I, it's just some Scala syntax, and then I'm done. <laughs> um, it's, it doesn't matter for now, but I just wanted to show you that um, in many cases, especially when your types have repeated elements, there will be more than one way of satisfying your type. And then choosing between these ways is going to be a problem. So I have heuristics for tuples. And let me just say, uh, if I have a tuple of one, two, three, uh, what would that be? Okay, so that is the right thing, or at least the one you think. So sum is equivalent to uh, just in Haskell. And so, so this is does not this does not permute the order. All right, so that's the kind of thing you just write a type, 
In Scala, you, you write the type in one line, and Haskell is in a separate line, but basically you write the type and you just say, I want it to be implemented. Same thing as, I, as you do in, the, um, in, in this. You just say there's a hole, and then Emacs will you press some control, control, control something. <laughs> <laughs> you will get uh, uh, this whole field uh, by by automatic derivation. All right. So I have still a little time to talk about. Um, yeah. So just just uh, I want to finish the practical part, and then I will talk a little about the theoretical part and, or algorithm. Um, so. You can, you can actually tr try to use it. I've used it in Scala, because I, I work in Scala um, at my job. And I tried to put it in, to, to actually create code, right? Um, it's, uh, some, it's, it's most of the time not working. <laughs> For a variety of reasons. One of the reasons is what I just showed you. There are a lot of types, it turns out, with repeated things, and it's hard to reason about them. And so that's kind of hard. Another uh, problem is um, you, you rarely have in real code functions of pure generic kinds. You have libraries, you have all kinds of stuff, and those have to be cleanly handled. And that's something that I, I can think about how to do. But in any case, in some cases, you can do it. In some cases, you can put it in. Um, for instance, for instance, you want to derive your type classes. Well, in Haskell now we have, you know, derive everything, derive more than everything. But, um, <laughs> uh, you know, in, suppose you, you had to derive an instance of your type class and you have a type and you need code and you, you know it's obvious. Or maybe you don't know it's obvious. Yeah, by the way, what about that type? Does anyone know here if that type is implementable? A, B, which is A to B to A to A to B to B with one, two, three. Yeah. <laughs> and what's the code? Um, yeah, well, you can you can figure out what the code is, right? So um, f, and then uh, let's see, a to b to a to a. Oh, if I say b here, it probably won't work. But this is quite funny. This thing. Okay, now you now you see. <laughs> That's it. Now it's obvious. Um, <laughs> so um, there are the, the limitations of this is that heuristics fail. You get repeated, um, repeated implementations. Uh, you need, so the Emacs interface will show you several of them you can choose from. That kind of thing is necessary. Recursive code cannot be generated, at least not with this algorithm. And also, you cannot generate functions that depend on uh, type class instances. So, for example, if f is an unknown functor, and I want to use uh, f, right? Um, no. So that. <laughs> so, in Gen, is the integration with Monad is, is is there a custom integration to make it work nope. with Monad? It doesn't. Oh, really? What it does is that it's just a shortcut to have a um, a bunch of types uh, uh, asked for you. Mm -hmm. That's all. So it's just a short that you don't, it doesn't actually, you can't actually say that F is a monad if we're doing something. So you can ask for a monad, but you can, you can define monad, but you, don't, you cannot actually say F is a monad, now derive me this. I don't, and, uh, okay, so let me, let me go on and say that what works is a type expression that's made out of these constructions. Okay, so, um, Product, function, uh, coproduct, or disjunction, unit type, and you can have type parameters, and that's it. There's nothing else you can use. Once you are limited to this, you are within, um, so this is a Haskell syntax for these things. If, 
if all you, all, all you can do is generate code that uses these constructions. So then the question is, what are the constructions that you need to generate a, a value of a given type? Uh, so to do this, we use the Curry-Howard correspondence, which is a correspondence between types and logical propositions. And here's how it works. So for each type, if you have a code like this, you say, basically, you can compute the value of type T. Um, so we call this proposition CH of T. Code has a value of type T. Um, and CH also stands for Curry Howard. So um, basically, the question is then, what are the uh, expressions that you can derive? What, what are the expressions you can compute? If you're given expressions of certain types, and the observation here is that uh, in the language, you have only a limited number of constructions about how to make uh, expressions of certain types and how to use them. So for example, you can make a pair out of two and you can use the pair to get one of them and so on. You can make a function and you can apply function to arguments. You can make a disjunction type and you can uh, destructure it, you can ma match it, and so on. So you have these, uh, each of these means if you have a value of this type, then you, and you have value of this type, then you can have a value of the pair type. So that's a logical uh, derivation rule for uh, these propositions. If you have a value of type A, and you have a value of type B, then you can have uh, a tuple AB. So you see, there is a, a correspondence. Each of these constructions that we just saw corresponds to logical operation between um, the statements about what you can compute. And so it means that if you are able to derive something logically, then you could trace it back to these constructions and find out what code computed that, uh, that value. Um, and then you find that uh, all the propositions that can be proved in logic correspond to types that can be implemented and vice versa. And so uh, this is the curry howard correspondence. It's a correspondence between types and propositions and also between code and proofs. So if you have a proof, and actually, so the, the, the key observation is that it's much easier to talk about logical propositions than about code. This code has a lot of stuff you can compute. And logical propositions are just true or false. And so uh, you omit a lot of information about your program uh, by going to types and from types to propositions. But you gain the ability to reason much more effectively about the propositions. So what you do then is you say each of these constructions uh, is a derivation rule in the logic. So derivation rules in the logic are usually uh, denoted by the so-called sequence. Now a sequence is this notation where you say there are, two, there are several propositions on the left, then there's a turnstile symbol, and then there's a proposition on the right. And uh, these are the premises, and this is the goal. And the uh, sequence means in the code, it means you have an expression of type G that uses types A, B, and C in some way. So here's an example. This is an expression of type string. Suppose that X is integer. Then this is an expression of type string that uses integer X. Uh, so X is computed somewhere else, right? It's not computed here. It's computed somewhere else. Um, so this, this type would be string, but it uses integers. So it is a string that can be computed only if somebody gives you an integer. So that is the sequence denoted like that. And then uh, the function is a sequence which is like this, because it doesn't have any free variables. It can be computed um, without any premises. <coughs> so first step is to write down the sequence, and then you, uh, you have a logic. So you have a sequence that show you what you can derive from what. And then finally, you look for mathematical literature to see how this logic can be derived. Uh, I'm skipping a lot of these slides, but I'm just going to show you. Okay, here it is. 
I'm going to show you. So th these are the uh, logical rules that follow directly from the language um, written in sequence. So for example, um, this is the match statement uh, or case, case expression. Uh, so if you have um, a disjunction, you have two functions from A to C and from B to C. Uh, you have a uh, uh, disjunction type that has either A or B, then you can derive C from this. So this is the case expression in, in Haskell, uh, this one. Uh, it requires two functions. This is the first function. This is the second function. And that's what we see right there. OK, so uh, then you say, OK, well, I can't really look for proof using this. This doesn't work. because. These rules are not good enough. They are, they're correct, but they don't give you an algorithm for search. So if you just look, in other words, if you just look through uh, these uh, constructions, you cannot do a search, make a search tree out of this. OK, well, then you say, uh, well, mathematicians are very clever. Maybe they found it. <laughs> um, so yeah, so one uh, mathematician named uh, Gensen uh, published this calculus as he called it in 1935. And these are rules that, are, that look quite different from those rules, but they're equivalent. It's very hard to show that they're equivalent, and I'm going to pretend that I know how to do it. <laughs> but uh, the advantage of these rules is that, the, um, so each rule says, if you want to prove this, you need to prove this. If you want to prove this, you need to prove this. So now this is our familiar case expression. If you want to prove um, that from uh, either AB follows C, then you need to have two functions from A to C and from B to C, uh, and so on. So uh, this is the algorithm. Okay? So you have some type expression. You transform it into a logical expression by just plus is the disjunction, times is the product or tuple, this is the function type, and this is the unit type. So unit type is a true, and uh, that's how you translate. And then you just look at the bottom, and you see what matches your expression, or any part of your expression. And then you say, OK, I need to prove this. It means I need to prove this and this. Let me then have a recursive proof tree by this. So, so the advantage of this calculus is that it gives you an algorithm. The algorithm is not great, but it works. Um, now, all of the libraries I'm talking about, I was talking about, the Jim library, the Just Do It, and my own uh, Curry Howard library, they all use an algorithm which is called LJT, which is a slight improvement on this one. And uh, it has four rules in addition to these. And basically, it gives you a finite proof tree. So here's how it works. Um, you first write such a thing. So this is your type you want to implement. Then you find which rule. Well, first you write a sequence. So sequence means no premises. Uh, and you derive this. Which rule matches the sequence? Well, you look at the rules. None of this on the left can match. Maybe something on the right. OK, this one. On the right, we have a function type implication. OK, and that's what we have on the right. We apply that rule. So this is now A. This is B. This is this rule. Now we have to prove this sequence, and so on. So we, can, we just recursively apply that idea. And we have a proof tree. So I don't have time to go through this, but uh, basically, you just look at what rule applies, you replace sequence by more sequence, and then um, this calculus is very good because it's proved that the search tree will be finite. There will be no loops in it. It will just go and stop. Once you exhaustively search through it and you found no proof, that means the type actually cannot be implemented. And if you found proofs, then you can go back. And every time you have one of these rules, you, they correspond to code. So for example, this corresponds to a case expression. You insert that case expression into your uh, scratch 
space and you build up the code after it. So basically first you look for the proof and then you go back from axioms and build up the code expression. And the result could be quite big and then you need to simplify it. So it's just lambda calculus evaluation for those who know what that is. Um, uh, did I get an, yeah, I got an example here. So uh, I don't have, I don't, I, I don't want to go into this. This is quite tedious, but basically you just go through all your rules. Each rule gives you some code snippet. You put them all together and you have code like this, code like this, and then it's that. And you simplify and finally you get this code. And that's what you output. So the library uh, does this. All of these people use the calculus LJT for the reason that it's the only calculus that is explained in a clear way in literature. <laughs> um, there are lots of logicians who published on this subject trying to improve this. Um, most of what they published is useless because either you can't understand a single word of what they're saying or because it's all about proving that this is Im implemented, but not finding the code. <laughs> so you can actually cut a lot of corners if you don't need to know the proof. If you just need to know that it exists, and of course for academics, that's good enough, but not for <laughs> us. Uh, so uh, especially if you want to keep all the branches of the proof tree to find more implementations, because you want to choose you know, implementation that um, satisfies algebraic laws for your type class. Uh, this is the calculus that does it. It has uh, simple enough implementation, just a depth first search uh, with some sorting on the results, um, reasonably easy to implement, uh, and that's why everybody's doing it. You know, there are papers trying to improve this. Um, as you see, this is how long it takes to come up with uh, something that works well. But, um, these people, uh, Vorobyov, Hudenmaya, Dikov, uh, they are, you know, they, they have spent their entire lives studying. It's a very hard question because you have to prove that everything you prove using this would be equivalent to what you prove using, using that. Uh, right? I mean, it's, it's a very hard uh, question, but they have done it. We don't have to. All right. So let me just conclude. Um, so we map uh, the type system of a programming language into logical propositions. If that logic is decidable, then there's an algorithm that tells us what the proof is or that there is no proof. And if there's a proof, we can go back to the code snippets, put them together. So each of them will be a little case expression or a little tuple or a little something else or function application. We'll put them together. It's all automatic. It's all, all mechanical. And after this, you get some lambda expression. Well, a, a bunch of code, really, that you could try to simplify. Um, and in many cases, you would have more than one implementation. So you need to choose one in some way. Um, I showed you implementations in Scala and Haskell. Sure. Well, uh, maybe a little usable. <laughs> and uh, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. So the LJT algorithm, that's not guaranteed optimal. It's just guaranteed to be finite. Uh, well, <laughs> so this, this thing is, has exponential complexity. Okay. So I'm not sure what Optima would mean. Right. Uh, right. You can make it. You can make it quicker. You can make it quicker. Uh, and there are people who write any papers in this. Uh, what they don't want, or rather, the, what I don't know is what they say would actually give me uh, workable code. So um, in practice, this is not very slow. It is, I did not try to optimize very much in my code, and also there, uh, you, can, you can easily make it uh, slow if you write a big type expression. And so, yeah. Do you find the combinatorial expression of possibilities in the complex type? 
ridiculous the number we just have to yeah I, I have I have examples I'm not sure <laughs> yeah um, I have examples like I, I gave you that that example that monad uh, the, the funny one with uh, what did I, what did I do integer to uh, a to integer to a yeah right here so this one is already quite involved if you if you want to um, if you want to bind uh, for it the type signature of bind would be quite long now if you put a, a couple of monad transformers on top of this um, you can get a really interesting type expression and uh, that especially if it has a maybe <laughs> because every time you have these junctions that just multiplies your possibilities so if you look at the if you look at the rules the disjunction is, is is not great because it makes you prove more things mm -hmm. uh, so also having a function as a premise is not great but um, this junction is particularly bad because it just explodes and so if you have a bunch of maybes in there preferably in functions and everywhere <laughs> um, that could explode so in my implementation I had to cut down uh, and sort uh, the tree heuristically uh, because I well the, the JVM was just running out of memory and uh, I couldn't get my tests to pass um, but yeah that's that's a real problem so actually for deriving a monad instance of a complicated type I would not recommend just blindly going for type but rather to do constructions you know uh, Product uh, where they're, they're construction that make monads out of pieces, uh, monad transformers, and so on. So, so try to follow that and have an algorithm that will try to do that rather than try to just take the type blindly. And out of a gazillion, I mean, there are, there are hundreds of thousands of implementations of such things that you know that just return nothing in some place <laughs> and return nothing in another place. We do nothing in both places, <laughs> and and you know it's just exponentially many. But when we find it, <laughs> yeah, only, uh, yeah, oh yeah, exponentially large, um, and and that's that's the problem. Yeah. Um. Do you think it would be possible to hook it up with something kind of quick check like so that like the the last heuristic is just like does it do what you want it? Right. So, um, in fact, yes. So if you know the laws you want to satisfy, you should do that. And um, I was going into that direction with my library, uh, trying to pro provide a way for people to, let's say I have six implementations, return all of them and run maybe tests at runtime before you start using these implementations. So yes, that would be uh, one way of doing this, but I would actually think, um, you know what, what? What Haskell does when it does derive functor or derive uh, well derive generic and so on. That's a better approach because you know what you're. If you know what you're trying to derive, you're trying to, not just deriving implementation of something, right? You, you're deriving a type class. You know the laws. You need to know that. If you know that, it's much easier. First of all, to derive those things. I mean, derive traversable, derive foldable is just obvious. There's nothing to do there. Um, it's much easier, there's no combinatorial explosion, and you're guaranteed to have the right results. And this is dangerous for those things. Yeah. Um, I was kind of curious if you know if there's any relation between this algorithm and things like Cygus solvers. Uh, so, solvers, sorry, which solvers? I couldn't hear. Cygus, which is like a SAT. Sad solvers, right? So, is there any relation with sad solvers? Um, it's hard to say. I think uh, sad solvers are fundamentally too limited to solve a, a combinatorial problem like this. Uh, but maybe if you if you you could probably if you knew that your solution is not too big, you could probably do. A formulation of terms of sad solvers, but uh, there is no direct relationship as far as I know. I don't, I haven't ever seen that. You had that question? Uh, yeah, so uh, I was interested in the, uh, the limitations you mentioned. So there's, you said that um, it's not good with um, constraints such as functor on the types. 
mm. uh, and with recursion. Yeah. Um, so I was wondering if there are ways to get around with limitations. Um, it, it seems like with a functor type class instance, you could just actualize that as a as a um, the dictionary for the functor, right? As a input to the you would have to implement that as an additional derivation rule in the logic. I mm -hmm. believe you cannot just see this logic is first order in types, so it does not have higher kind of types. I see. So you would have to. In, inject a rule into the logic that you know, whenever you need to map one into another, you, you have a functor f map for that. I see. Uh, and this rule would probably negate the properties of the logical system, and your, your tree might become circular, uh, or you might, I don't know what might happen. The same thing with recursion. So you could try to say, oh, recursive is easy. It's just that I have a recursive instance that I already derived in the previous recursive step, and I can use it, right? So I can, I can use the function I'm trying to derive, but only at the recursive step. So I'm not, I'm not allowed to use it right away. Mm -hmm. I have to do something before you. I can try to fudge your, yourself into that kind of solution, and that might screw up the logic. Nobody knows what will happen. Uh, these logicians have not studied this case. As far as, I, as far as I know, maybe maybe some have, but I haven't seen it. So uh, it will be experimental. It will be very interesting to try. Mm -hmm. And then I would have to fortify my uh, proof search against possible loops. Uh, I would have to do more heuristics, perhaps, to do the type class instance derivation. So I would I would say this is hard. Uh, especially since I, I just showed you this logic is propositional, so it does not have, it, it cannot actually have quantifiers inside. Mm -hmm. All the quantifiers are outside. They're all always universally quantified, and, and inside are just propositions. So it's a propositional logic. It does not have a concept of such a thing. As, so as you, a, could, you couldn't encode that as you know, no. Wrong. So this would be this would be encoded as a new derivation rule in the logic, which is that this is a special thing f, and if you have f a and you want f b out of it, then maybe you can do it if you have a to b, and that's a special rule, mm -hmm. which uh, you know which doesn't follow from anything, and you cannot put an extra premise to make that rule work, is that rule works with a quantified type A and B, mm -hmm. and that is not, uh, not, not expressed in this logic. So um, that's why neither I nor these other people who implemented the Haskell versions tried to do it. You're just scared, you know. <laughs> no idea if you even have a search tree now. Because you, you know, you, you, you've, you've killed the logic, so you've added stuff to this. Now, another 40 years of study, maybe you know what, what, what happens. <laughs> um, is, is there any approach to, so general recursion seems like uh, very incompatible with logic since it's you know, the rule A to A gives A, uh, A implies A does not imply A. Is there any way to, to use something like recursion schemes, like a, a subset of recursion, specific kinds of recursion that would be searchable? Um, uh, maybe. Uh, so my guess is that if you want a recursion scheme, that would be an extra rule of derivation in your logic. Mm -hmm. And so when I, when I make my search tree, I start with this. These rules and these rules. So these rules tell me how my search tree might branch. Now with recursion scheme, I have another rule that, mm -hmm. might, that tells me how I might branch. Because if I need to derive something that has this recursive type, then I may do this. And okay, that's, I would say, needs to be tested. Mm -hmm. uh, you can try to do this, but this is the same, in the same ballpark as extending with, uh, with Type class. So it's adding new derivation rules I see. that have not been analyzed by uh, logicians, and uh, maybe you get some results sometimes. Well, one the one thing, for instance, that's hard. Um, let's map x. Let's map a to list of a. 
how do we do that? Well, list of A is either empty uh, or it's A and a list of A. So we, we, we can map A to empty, we're done. Right? Mm -hmm. No, well, this is not nice. This is not interesting. <laughs> mm, okay, another implementation. I can map A to uh, this A, and then I still need to produce a list of A. But I already have a recursive implementation from A to list of A. I'm done, right? No, it's going to be infinite. Uh, it's not what I want. It's hard to say what implementation I want if I allow recursion. Now suddenly I have a bunch of stuff, a bunch of solutions. Right. Recursion is hard uh, for this kind of approach. I thought of trying it, but well, I might. But so far I don't have a good approach generally to, to do it. Um, that's, I mean, you have, to, you have to do more than recursion schemes, maybe I need, I need more constraints, what, what's, what can happen. Right. Maybe some specific recursion schemes. There's no obvious terminal uh, object in that thing, right? In what? In, in that scheme. Um, it's not clear where to, when to stop. So in order to, in order to um, uh, implement the code for a, the function a to list of a, I need to do a recursive expansion of the type list twice. And then the first time I expand, I get nil and uh, a and list of a. The second time I get again nil and a and list of a. So the first time I don't choose nil, but the second time I do. And then I have what I want. <laughs> All right, well, maybe there's some heuristic that will tell me how to do this, maybe not. Um, this is hard for me to, to see right now. This example kind of stopped me from exploring, but maybe this is not so bad. Maybe I'm just too scared. <laughs> I mean, these things are scary enough, right? I uh, have no idea what they do. And I, I, I skipped uh, a bunch of explanations here, but feel free to ask me if you're interested. I mean, it seems like in order to make an assertion about recursion, you have to have something akin to dependent types where you can assert that you are converging rather than diverging. Mm -hmm. But if you can encode NATS or some element of size or growth, like dependent types, you mm -hmm. can do recursion, which is why I think interest is capable of finding recursive solutions. That could be. That could be. I mean, this. I'll be very interested to know how Idris does it. I would not be surprised if they use the same calculus, uh, but they might have more information about your, your type. Well, you can do it on list, but you could do it on vector where you have information about the mm, I see. That's so that's the Idris can't write the code. Yeah. Like yeah, it can. Yeah. It can, it can, in some cases. Just that Idris has has a stricter has, has a more powerful type system, so you can give more information. But I'm pretty sure that the same problems will occur with Idris if you if you're given the same things. Right. Right. It's not perfect. That is meant to imply that you could do better with person solutions with stronger types. You could do better if you had dependent types. That's true. <laughs>